All right. Whoa, <laughs> the gallery is filling up. Hey, everybody. Yay. Connecting to audio, everybody. Give you a minute to get settled. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Deborah, Sharon. So nice to see everybody. My internet's a little bit laggy, but fortunately Debs isn't. So you can put up with me in order to listen to her. <laughs> Polly. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> How's everybody doing? I was wondering if anybody had any first signs of spring. In the Northeast of Pennsylvania, we have winter aconite and crocus and snowdrop that are blooming in my garden. You can put in the chat if you've got something growing in your garden. And if you're lucky enough to have a year round garden, you probably have lots of things in your garden. But those first, first flowers, oh, they're so precious. Winter aconite is a sunny yellow flower and it stays blooming for a long time, just hanging out there. And then I have hellebora that's coming. Pussy willow, yes. <laughs> so much snow, Pauline. Daffodils, wow. Hmm. So Ryan, you want to kick off with a few technical details? Sure, Karis, I'd love to. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Ryan. I'm on the Botanical Eyes team here, along with Abby and Emma and Karis. And I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, wow. So yeah, people keep on coming in. So we'll just take a moment and review a few technical details as we get started. Um, well, we're using Zoom, which you all know. And I wanna point out a couple things about how you can make the most out of this experience. So the first is up in the top right, you can switch between speaker view and gallery view. So if you wanna to go to gallery view, you can see all the people here. And I just wanna invite you, if you would like, you can have your video on or off, it's totally up to you. If you're in gallery view and you have your video on, let's all wave hi. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's, all, it's so fun to see everybody, um, see everybody waving. So we are going to keep muted during Deb's presentation so that there's no interruptions, accidental or otherwise. And then um, at the end of the presentation, we'll do some Q&A, some, dis some open discussion. And we always uh, are really excited because when we do a big program, a big botanic wise program, like the one that's coming up with Deb, we love to provide a lot of educational content and free stuff leading up to it. So we're gonna have, wait until the very end and then um, we'll reveal some of the information about Deb's upcoming Botanicwise program and a special bonus for those that are interested. So we'll save that to the end. And the other thing you should know about Zoom is that, um, let's see, we are gonna be recording tonight. So. Um, we will be able to provide the replay after this event. And there's also a place where you can um, see subtitle settings. Let's see. Let me make sure that that's on. Um, you should see a subtitle uh, CC, live transcript. It should say in your toolbar. If you have any problems with that, you can send us a message in the chat. We'd be happy to help with that. Um, and that just allows you to um, turn on and off subtitles. So. Abby, did I miss anything? No, I think you got it all. <laughs> awesome. Great. All right. So are we ready to go? Yeah, let's get started. Everybody so comfortable? You have tea? I've got my tea. <laughs> all right. Um, always tea. <laughs> So if you have not met me, my name is Kara Slindruth, and I am the founder and organizer of Botanic Wise. And I'm so honored this evening to have my special friend and mentor teacher for probably 30 years now. Deb Soul has continued to inspire me to walk the plant path, 
to walk the earth lightly, to honor the sun and the moon and the seasons, to get into my garden especially. One of the first classes she ever I ever attended was at the New England Women's Herbal um, Conference. And she was uh, teaching about planting for pollinators. And I was so excited to get back home and start planting some of these precious plants in my garden that attract pollinators. And ever since then, I've been following her around like a puppy. So <laughs> I want to say pinch me that she's here, even though we've, we've grown to be quite intimate friends over the years. I still always feel that way about her. If you have not met her, Deb is a, um, a renowned gardener. She's an herbalist, a teacher, and an author of three books, The Woman's Handbook of Healing Herbs and How to Move Like a Gardener, and her most recent book, the Healing Garden, which was the textbook, in a sense, textbook uh, for our Botanic Wise program that she uh, taught last year called The Healing Garden. She is the gardener and founder of Avena Botanicals in Rockport, Maine. And um, there she both grows beautiful medicinal plants and makes beautiful medicine out of them. So uh, you're going to learn a lot about who she is just by the uh, essence of this presentation. You're going to really get an insight into Deb's beautiful spirit. So Deb, welcome mm -hmm. and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Karis and Ryan and Abby and Emma. You're such an awesome team and also just really want to thank everybody for, for uh, circling up here tonight together. And um I heard morning doves this evening. That's also a sign of spring. So really beautiful to be, um, yeah, just the, the early signs of spring here. So I'm going to share my screen. And we will um, be getting to look at some beautiful images this evening. So I just wanted to say that if you were with us last week, you will see the same images. And I will just be continuing to share the story of soil as a living, I say a soil is like a living, breathing being. And one of my most favorite topics to share and inspire other people, whether you're a gardener or not, soil is, I say soil is where it's at. <laughs> so i um, happy to be sharing my love of soil and seeds and the healing plants with all of you tonight. So I wanted to begin um, by just honoring, this is the, the rising of the sun at the winter solstice. This is um, rising over Penobscot Bay, which is near where I live in the mid coast part of what is now called Maine. And also to remind us that we are approaching the spring equinox. So this is a very special week, I, I think. Um, we have a full moon this week and we have the spring equinox. So I wanna just encourage each of you, Sunday, March 20th is the spring equinox. So I wanna just encourage you all to think about getting up at sunrise before sunrise actually on Sunday. And if it's rainy, do it on Monday. However it is, it's gonna be a little rainy here. I'm gonna rise up and go to this same hill. This is where I like to go on the solstices and the equinoxes to watch the sunrise. And this is also a place sometimes where I go to watch the moon rise up over the sea. So wherever you are, just really encourage you to, to have that joy of rising up before sunrise and seeing on the Eastern horizon where the sun rises. And in this particular photograph, this is the sun has come to the most Southern place on the Eastern horizon. And so the sun will be rising much further to the left on the spring equinox. And then that again on the summer solstice. So such a joy to be present with the, the, the daily rhythms of the sun rising and the lunar cycles and this, these beautiful seasonal rhythms that especially for us who live in the Northeast are very, very distinct. And I wanted to honor the land where I am. I am in Wabanaki, the 
the Wabanaki territory. Wabanaki means the people of the dawn, and you could see that beautiful sunrise of which I get to participate in. And the Wabanaki Confederacy is made up of the Maliseet, the Mi'kmaq, the Passamaquoddy, and the Penobscot. So I was recently um, told what the Penobscot word for soil is, soil or turned earth, pronounced Dupquan. And my friend actually who had pointed me to this word for the Penobscot said that the Penobscot teacher who had spoken that word in a class that she was in actually um, gently wept tears when he spoke this word. So this is for me just a reminder of how sacred soil is. And soil is much more than just, you know, what people call dirt. Soil is soil is infused with just the stories of the original peoples, indigenous peoples, wherever we all have come from, this, the soil holds our story. So it is very sacred. So I wanna give a bow of gratitude to the, the Penobscot who I live absolutely in their territory and it's unceded territory. And I am very grateful for their stewardship for well over 12,000 years. And if you are unfamiliar with whose territory you're in, when you get the recording of this presentation, you'll be able to go and uh, click on where you live and be able to see who are, whose territory you're in and the languages that they speak. Um, you'll be able to see whether those languages are still being spoken and also the treaties that were broken. So again, I for me, as a long time uh, person very connected to healing plants and trees and pollinators and soil and water. Um, and I also was born and raised here in, in, in Maine. I wanna just encourage people if you're unfamiliar with your territories, please um, take that time to research whose territory you're living in and, and to continue your own study of the history of indigenous peoples and also depending on where you live, do some research to understand if there were enslaved people also stolen from Africa who may have been living and working where you live. These are part of the, the repair and the healing and the mending journey that we're all in. So if you're comfortable, just um, close your eyes for a minute and I'm gonna read this quote kind of as a prayer. And this comes from the book, Grandmother's Council of the World. And this is again to honor um, indigenous people of North America and indigenous grandmothers all around the world. The indigenous, the 13 indigenous grandmothers tell us that in the beginning, there was only one creator, one divine intelligence. And so all things created since the beginning of time are suffused with the same sacred essence. Thus, our very existence on earth implies a profound spiritual connection to the earth, to all of nature and to the spirit world, as everything is a part of the one divine intelligence inherent in all of creation. And I also wanted to honor Rocio Alacon. Some of you have had the the blessing to study with her and Karis will be bringing um, Rocio to do some speaking in April. And Rocio is born and raised in Ecuador from a lineage of healers and shamans in her family's lineage. This is a photograph I took of her actually in 2008. I was with her in the Basque country, the Spanish side, and she was working on her PhD collecting as much traditional medicinal knowledge as she could from local people. And this is a man who she spent time with who grew up as a shepherd and every summer would take the cows up into the forests and the meadows way up above the village where he lived. And he knew like every plant and he knew so much about their medicinal and their edible uses. So this is really also for me, um, as one who has been really blessed to be working with 
healing plants for over 45 years since I was a teenager. I just really want to honor all Indigenous peoples around the world who, who are caregivers for healing plants and for the different ecosystems that they live in and that they protect these important healing plants. So in this presentation this evening, I'm also gonna offer uh, some different of my favorite uh, resources, books, and plants have so much to give us. All we have to do is ask is a, is a book I turn to again and again and again. Um, and Mary, who is the author of this book, she was uh, the apprentice for Kiwe Denokwe, who is an Anishinaabe, an Ojibwe, uh, credible medicine person. And Mary was requested by Kiwe Denokwe to actually write her stories to, to her teachings. So this book, I just think this book should be in everybody's shelf. It's a very, very important book. Um, and Mary and Kiwe Denokwe are so generous to share um, their traditional plant medicines with all of us through this book. And I also wanted to honor the, the midwives and the herbalists of Central America. This book um, is the telling of the life of a Mayan healer from Belize, Ms. Beatrice. And she basically spoke her story and it was uh, written down and then published in this book. And so again, the opportunity to read read the story of an incredible healer. And this is another book that I um, found last year. Um, Antonia, who is a wonderful plant person and runs Urban Cura, she, she introduced me to this book and this particular author. And I just wanted to read his quote. Um, and I don't know how to exactly pronounce Iwigara correctly, The Kinship of Plants and People. But Enrique writes, Iwigari channels the idea that all of life, spiritual and physical, is interconnected in a continual cycle and expresses the belief that all life shares the same breath. We are all related to and play a role in the complexity of life. So I wanted to begin um, you know, I can't really talk about soil if I don't really speak to the wisdom that indigenous people around the world have and continue to hold of plants and the kinship of plants and people. It's such a beautiful title and it's a beautiful, beautiful book. And as he speaks about sharing the same breath, that also really inspired me to go back to reading a little bit of the tradition in ancient Greece and I think in other places, sort of in old Mediterranean regions and in Eastern Europe. But this is such a beautiful image of in Delphi, they were talking about that there was this place, it was like a crack in the earth where there was like, I say it's like the breath of the earth. She's breathing. We know that the earth breathes. And it was like through sacred smoke, her breath was coming up and the female priest called Pythia would sit here. And people would come to her to ask for oracular guidance for their questions. And here we say, they were saying, you know, these vapors, this breath of the earth is considered to be the great goddess or, or Gaia, the eldest, the mother of all gods. So here we also begin to see this notion of the sacredness of earth um, in very, very, another very, very old tradition. And earth as mother. So the Lithuanian archaeologist who I'm going to speak to a little bit right now, she, um, in her book, The Language of the Goddess, which if you do not know Maria's book, books and you don't know her work, I hope that you'll be inspired to seek her out. She was uh, trained, formally trained as an archaeologist and an anthropologist. She was born and raised in Lithuania, um, and she herself had to flee um, in the 60s when Russia invaded Lithuania. But Maria's work, I think, has still yet to be fully recognized. She unearthed thousands and thousands of goddess-shaped figurines throughout old Europe and Eastern Europe. 
And as she writes here, it would seem logical to look for the origin of the earth fertility goddess at the dawn of agriculture, because a Neolithic goddess had the ability to bring forth all life from her own body. She must have been also endowed with the power to nurture the seeds of the earth. And I just was reminding us of, um, you know, she's saying that it was even earlier than the Neolithic time, the Paleolithic time, which is, you know, as I, as she said here, 26, 2.6 million years ago to about 10,000 years ago. And this particular image, which is a very, very famous image, the Venus of La Salle that was found at the entrance of a cave in France 20 to 25,000 years ago. So I'm kind of building this picture for us of across cultures, how sacred earth is and that earth is considered to be mother. So this is Maria Gambudis, a photograph of her. She passed away in 1994. And I um, had the great honor to actually meet Maria in the late 80s and, and study with her a little bit. And then I went to visit her in California before she passed away. And she and I corresponded. And these are three videos that, um, if again, as I was saying, if you're unfamiliar with Maria's work, please consider um, watching these videos. She was incredibly, she is incredibly inspiring to me still, though she has passed away um, almost 30 years ago. And as I said, these videos are very old. They, um, you know, they're over 30 years old. There's archival footage of her being recorded, of her speaking. So they're not like fancy documentary films. This is the real stuff of Maria's voice, Maria's incredible wisdom. And also when I was researching a little bit of um, some things I wanted to say, I love what I found when she writes, the earth mother is regarded as being pregnant in the spring and thus has to be protected and respected, especially on her name day, the 25th of March. It was a very grave sin for the peasants of Western Ukraine to strike the earth or to spit, dig holes or plow. There is a saying in Poland and Russia that to strike the earth is the same as striking your own mother. And if the earth mother is insulted, she will moan and groan. So I, I found this quote actually before Ukraine was invaded. And um, I, I just want to encourage everybody to mark on your calendar March 25th. And maybe there's a way that both Botanic Wise and Avina and others of us can really spread the word of this particular day and have it be a day that we can also continue to stand in solidarity um, with the intense suffering that is going on in this part of the world and in many places in the world. So again, we are being reminded of by Maria's work, by various indigenous peoples around the world that it is the time to deeply, deeply stand up and speak on behalf of Earth Mother. And Leah Peniman has done that really, really well in her book, Farming While Black. So I wanted to also give gratitude and uplift the wisdom that um, black and brown farmers have always had in their understanding of working with soil and growing food and providing for their community. So if you don't have Leah's book, I think it's a really important book to have in, in any garden or farm library. It's full of, it's just packed full of information that I think is very, very important and very useful for anybody. And so I want to thank Leah for her generosity and for all the commitments that Soul Fire Farm has to teaching and inspiring more black and brown farmers and gardeners. And the, the drawing, the painting on the left is from the beginning of the book. It says, this book is dedicated to our ancestral grandmothers who braided seeds in their hair before being forced to board transatlantic slave ships, believing against the odds in a future of sovereignty on land. So again, um, seeds, as we all know, hold ancestral memory. And they are so important that each of us in our own ways, and we'll talk about this more, is, is really dedicated to preserving um, non-GMO seeds for the future. 
And Dr. George Washington Carver was a really extraordinary agricultural scientist. And he had he wrote many pamphlets and some books. And I I think that every every any any course that's teaching about agriculture should really uplift Dr. George Washington Carver. And in this article that Leah wrote actually for Yes Magazine, I really like when she says, I'm intentional about noting in my articles and speeches that Carver was one of the first agricultural scientists in the US to advocate for the use of leguminous cover crops, nutrient rich mulching and diversified agriculture. He advised every 20th century farmers to dedicate every spare moment to raking leaves, gathering rich earth from the woods, piling up muck from the swamps and hauling it to the land. Carver believed that unkindness to anything means an injustice done to that thing, a conviction that extended to both people and soil. So it just is a bow to Dr. Carver for his extraordinary work, for his dedication. Um, he, he lived into the 1940s and I would say that he is one of the most important people for anybody working in the world of um, regenerative organic agriculture. I think it's very, very important that we give so much of our, what we've learned is really good agriculture, regenerative farming practices that we want to really give a bow to Dr. Carver. So this is a picture someone took of my hands in soil here where I am in the coast of Maine. Um, I am blessed to have sandy loam. And obviously I've been in the farm where I am for 26 years, continuously working with very much what Dr. Carver speaks about with um, cover crops, crop rotation, building really beautiful compost. Yes, raking leaves, putting them into the compost, mulching beds with them, all the things that he mentions that we know helps us to be really good regenerative gardeners and farmers. And this is a quote from a book. I really love this book, Soil, Soul, Society. Satish Kumar is, um, I think he's in his late eighties now. He was born in India. Um, and as a young person, he uh, became a monk for many, many years. And he says, soil is the source of all life literally and metaphorically. All life comes from the mother soil and returns to her. Soil contains earth, air, fire, and water. If my outer body is soil, then my inner being is the soil, so soul. As I cultivate the soil to grow food for the body, I take care of the soul and cultivate love, compassion, beauty, and unity to realize the harmony within and without. And I, this quote to me, I, I should memorize this quote because I, it's almost like a mantra, like a prayer for me. I, his words just speak so deeply for the inner soul and the outer soil that we are tending, which then of course grows these beautiful medicine plants and food that nourishes our inner soil. So there's just this incredible interweaving of soil and our own soul and how it is that we care and tend for both. And soil is such a teacher in this conversation. So I wanted to just um, briefly introduce the notion of biodynamics as a, as a holistic ecological and spiritual approach to gardening. And I think for me, because my roots are from the Mediterranean and also from Ireland up into Scandinavia, um, I was really grateful to when I came upon biodynamics in 1986, actually, to be learning to start to study and learn and to practice some of the biodynamic techniques, which I think are very, very rooted in also rural peoples. And so Rudolf Steiner, who some people know as the founder of Waldorf Education, was asked by a number of farmers in Europe post-World War I, which we can only imagine the devastation of the land and the water and the devastation to animals and to people. 
So they people begged Rudolf Steiner for some guidance of how to re-enliven the soil and the viability of seeds, how to improve the health of animals. And so he gave these eight lectures in 1924. And that was sort of the foundation. And then he passed away a year later. So biodynamics um, has been really developed in these last hundred years by people all over the planet who take aspects of biodynamics and incorporate that into their own, um, wherever they are, what makes sense for that understanding. And as I said here, he was really influenced by his early life in rural Austria, where he also grew up around people who followed the rhythms of nature and relied on herbal medicine. So that's the impulse of which biodynamics comes out of, which is for me, you know, my, uh, as a teenager also being introduced to healing plants. So there's a resonance there for me. And I'm just gonna speak a little bit about biodynamics again, just to plant a few seeds for people who might be interested. Um, this is a picture of Ailey and me at, at Avena's garden. Um, we were stirring one of the biodynamic preparations and, the very famous one, which is called BD500, um, which we we stir and we spray just with, with kind of wooden brushes on open soil. We do that in the spring and then again in the fall. And this particular preparation really does help to enhance overall fertility of the soil, the microbiological activity, all those incredible beneficial bacteria that we're really trying to nourish in the soil. Um, 500 really helps to improve the soil structure and humus, which is so, so important. We want our topsoils to be just full of organic matter and humus, which are these stable carbon compounds. So um, yes, cover cropping and mulching and compost adds all of this quality to improving overall quality of soil and soil structure. And these preparations um, really help to enliven even more so kind of the relationship that the essence of the earth, that spirit of earth and relationship to the cosmos, we're bringing in that, that whole relationship with these biodynamic preparations. So I wanted to just introduce Gabby, who is um, I'm really excited to hear Gabby speak. She is going to be giving us a three hour lecture as part of the six week course that I'm teaching. She is, as, as she describes here, she's, she's actually a soil research and scientist and third generation Mexican farmer. And um, I, this is something you can go back to and read um, is an interview um, by her. But what I really appreciated in this interview, it's a long interview, definitely worth reading. Um, it was inspiring for me because Gabby has also um, helped to create a biodynamic organization in Mexico. And this is when she says the current agricultural processes by which we obtain food on a large scale have nothing to do with connection or with the life processes, much less with understanding these life processes as something sacred. The word agriculture lacks culture and reality, which is what gives meaning to the connection between the indigenous worldview and biodynamics. So I'm really grateful that we're all gonna get to be um, in the course, really getting to have a deep dive with Gabby into soil. And um, <laughs> she and I have been communicating, basically, you know, the course on soil could go for days and days and weeks and months, but we'll have a beautiful introduction with Gabby. And also I, I will speak some more in the course to, to this, this, which I said here, biodynamics is more than techniques. And I, what I'm trying to really help build a picture here for people um, whenever I talk about biodynamics and I wrote about it in one of my books is just that we're, we're moving beyond just the, both the conventional and organic way of thinking about soil amendments and just about soil only being about the physicality of soil. So I'm trying to help us enlarge in that really typical way of just thinking about what can I, what kind of substance can I give to amend the soil? 
And I think that's not unlike, I think, the industrial way of medicine, which is, you know, what herb can I use to replace this drug? So I use that same thinking. It's like we know that that is not successful. <laughs> it's so much bigger of how we are really supporting the life force of soil and the life force within us as humans. That's the level of which for me, um, there's another whole aspect of, of how biodynamics brings this understanding into our work with soil and into our work as, as human beings. Yeah. So for people who have never seen a biodynamic planting calendar, I just took a picture so you could see this is a calendar that come out, comes out annually. Um, I'm going to give you a few resources next for those of you who will have them if you're interested in purchasing a biodynamic calendar. But if you look at the date, today is the 14th of March. And I mean, the 15th of March, sorry. It's Tuesday the 15th. And is telling us that the moon... Um, was in Cancer and moved into Leo. So it gives us a lot of really good guidance about this is from an this is from an astronomical point of view, not the ast not the Western astrology. This is actually what's happening um, astronomically in the sky. And so we are planting, and I've been working with this calendar since 1986. This is how I was introduced to biodynamics. And this calendar, I just have to say, has offered me so much guidance, particularly in planting. So I organize all of my planting schedule based on whether I'm planting flowers or whether I'm planting leaf herbs like, you know, lemon balm or holy basil, you know, our leaf, we're planting for the leaf. Or if I'm planting um, things that are root, you know, roots, or like today is a fruit day, I'm actually going to start planting um a few things on Friday and I don't really get my greenhouse up and going until early April, but it's, this is such an incredible calendar for really giving even more specific guidance about planting. Yeah. Whether you're planting for flowers, leaves, or fruits, like, you know, your vegetables, your tomatoes, your peppers, um, or you're planting root crops. So I have found it to be really, really helpful for me. Oh, yes, the moon. So here we are. Um, I just wanted to, again, I mentioned that the full moon is Friday at 3.17 in the morning Eastern time. And then the equinox is on Sunday. So we are in a very powerful week right now. We are in a, in a waxing moon cycle. And we are, um, there's a lot of energy that's very expansive right now. So this is a time, you know, as we're moving towards this full moon, to just feel the energy of what is, what's expanding inside of you and what are some of those seeds, those expanded seeds metaphorically inside of you that you're wanting to plant in some symbolic way at the spring equinox. So this is a beautiful time, I think, as the stirring of spring and having this full moon be with us. And then these are some of the biodynamic resources that you can come back to um, you'll see at the very bottom is where you can get the biodynamic planting calendar. Anybody who orders from Fedco Seeds, they do sell the calendar. Um, and anybody who's really interested in the biodynamic preparations, I gave you two places to buy them. But for those of us up here in kind of the northeast or northern part of New England, the biodynamicsolutions.org folks, they're in New Hampshire. They're making beautiful preps. And as I, I've given you their website, you can go on and watch some of their videos about stirring and spreading the preparations. Yeah, so I'm gonna give you a few of my favorite books. Um, How to Move Like a Gardener is the book that I I wish that had been written when I was starting to study biodynamics. So the, cha the second chapter in that book is a very in-depth in chapter on a lot to do with biodynamics, as is the book on the right. Cosmos, Earth, and Nutrition um, is a book that I turn to often when I'm just trying to understand something a little more deeply. And Gardening at the Dragon's Gate 
came out in 2008. And Wendy Johnson is just an extraordinary gardener. So I love this book. I go back to this book again and again and again. Also, these are books. I'm giving you some of my favorite books that I go to quite a bit. Um, and Wendy Johnson has been a long time uh, Buddhist Zen practitioner. So she has a beautiful way of just weaving in. She's very practical, very grounded, and, and has a very really inspiring meditation practice. So that's a little bit woven in. And um, and the book on the left are not, it's not the agriculture course that was given by Steiner, but these are some lectures about, about agriculture that were given by Steiner. And then of course, um, Michael Phillips' uh, incredible, incredible book, Mycorrhizal Planet is a book that I actually, um, again, I read and I reread and I reread. I really appreciate his life's work. We are very blessed um, that Michael left us with this book. And Suzanne Samard's book also, um, I have found really interesting. She is a, a, a forest ecologist and forester up in British Columbia. And this book is woven both with her personal life story as she's weaving in how she came to better understand mycorrhizal activity and the, the soil of the forest. And then same thing, Entangled Life, Merlin Sheldrake um, gave us a beautiful book. This book came out last year and I appreciate his, his humility. He's a young person. I think he's probably in his early thirties, born and raised in, in uh, England and um, has, a, has some really good information for those of us who are interested in this incredible entangled life that makes up our soil. And then Pierre Masson from France also has given us a very practical, practical biodynamic manual. So those of you who are really interested in diving in more deeply into compost teas, fermented teas, and the biodynamic preparations, that's a really, really good book. And Adrian Marie Marie Brown continues to be somebody who really uh, inspires me with her incredible thinking, emergent strategy. I feel like this book, um, alongside Thich Nhat Hanh's book, um, I I got his book just before he passed. He passed in in a, just over forty nine days ago. He passed in January um, at age ninety five and left us, obviously, just dozens and dozens of books. And, and so many YouTube videos, they had their own YouTube channel. It's very, he's very, very inspiring to me, has been a teacher for me for over 30 years. And um, I, was, I was listening to a Dharma talk this weekend in honoring Thich Nhat Hanh's 49 days of passing. And they were, they were making fun of the title of this book, which I was so happy to hear that because when I, when I got the book, I was like, oh, it's such a, um, the art of saving the planet. I was like, I don't, I can't quite get behind those words. And they were, some of his, uh, one of the monks was saying the same thing. So we can just laugh and smile at the title and um, deeply, deeply enter into the wisdom that Thich Nhat Hanh has left us. So Adrian Marie Brown and Thich Nhat Hanh both, I think, um, in this time where we know that the climate crisis is a very, very, very serious crisis. And then also we know that, you know, ever since I was born, actually, there has been war. There have been wars in different places around the planet. So um, we just need, we need the wisdom of our spiritual teachers like Thich Nhat Hanh, who survived the Vietnam War and has so much to give us um, and left us with so much. So a great bow to him. And Rowan White, Mohawk woman, seed keeper. Um, I wanted to really uplift Rowan's, Rowan White's work. Um, this is a book that I had mentioned that I've ordered and um, the first printing is out, which is fantastic. And it's, it's being pre printed again. So this is a book I also really, I, I heard an interview and, and we've listed it here for you. You can hear the interview with her and a few other indigenous women um, who wrote for this book. And you'll also see Rowan is the founder of Sierra Seeds. So a really important seed, seed company to support. And 
There's a very, it's a seven minute film that she helped to create the seed mother and a podcast. So she's um, giving us a lot of really inspiring information and guidance and support here. And um, in this journey that we're all in together and this book, why would I call a quiet gardener and simple seed saver a revolutionary? I love that quote from Janice Ray's book. Another really important book for understanding seeds. And she also says seeds have a built-in generous a, a built-in requirement for generosity. So when I think seeds, I absolutely think that word generosity. Seeds are so 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 generous. So we have to be we have to make sure that we are all in our wherever we live in our ecosystems in our bioregions that we are saving seed that we are collecting seed that we are sharing seed with one another we don't want to just be the only ones who are collecting and saving it we want to be passing these seeds around because seeds are are also vulnerable we're vulnerable to weather we're vulnerable to as she says here, it's so I love I love this quote. You know, winter was like a river our ancestors had to cross, loaded with waterproof and mice-proof packets and bags to protect our seeds. So many, many thanks to um all peoples around the planet so dedicated to seed saving, including Vandana Shiva. This is a photograph of Navdanya's organic farm in North India. And Vandana Shiva, an extraordinary, um, she is a scientist and has dedicated well over 35 years to the work of organic agriculture and seed saving. And she says, seeds are a gift of nature and diverse cultures, not a corporate invention. Passing on this ancient heritage from generation to generation is a human duty and responsibility. Seeds are common property to be shared for the well-being of all and saved for the well-being of future generations and hence cannot be owned and patented. So a great shout out to Vandana Shiva. She's written so many books. Um, so if you, and you'll see her also on YouTube, a lot of videos. She's really dedicated her life to being very verbal, both in speaking and in writing on on seeds and soil and um, taking good care of ourselves. So this is actually a photograph that we took last fall of, these are figwort seeds. We do a lot of seed saving at Avena and um, figwort is a favorite one of mine. It's a perennial, um, very beautiful, tiny little flowers that hummingbirds really love. And they scatter seeds, they, they reseed so abundantly in the garden. So they're very, very generous in how they give to us seeds. And the, the tuber of figwort is very medicinal. It's a, it helps to decongest the lymphatic system. So here are some seed companies that I have different relationships with. And we also wanted to invite people this moment. Um, this in no way is an exhaustive list, but if you have um, a favorite seed company that you would like to share, um, at this moment, please put them in the chat. We're building um, a bigger seed um, company source for people. Um, and I, I know for myself, having started to garden, you know, 45 years ago, it's inspiring to me to see more and more small seed companies really committed to organic seeds and committed to their, their bioregion coming forth here. So thank you. I'm, I'm always so grateful to be learning myself of more really wonderful seed keepers and seed sources. And I also listed some of my favorite garden tools. This is a picture of the Hori Horis, which I always have a Hori Hori in my garden bucket. Um, I get them from, from Fedco. They have, as some of you who know, Fedco Seeds also has a whole organic grower supply um, connected to that organization. It's where I get Hori Hori and my Felco pruners and clippers. And they also, for people who are living in more um, small, small kind of environments, they, they sell an incredible collapsible drying rack. It's got like six different, I think I want to say six different um, kind of 
you can put it together, but it kind of can hang in your, the corner of your room. It's a really great collapsible drying rack. And I put the names of um, the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance. I really like to uplift these incredible indigenous basket makers who are keeping alive a very old, old tradition of making baskets. So you can go and visit their website and you can, I like to encourage people to have at least one really incredibly special indigenous made basket for your gathering of medicine plants. It's an honoring of the First Nations people, the original peoples, and it's also an honoring of the medicine plants that you're gathering. And I'm gonna just kind of end tonight's presentation by just talking a, a few things about, about planting seeds. This is a seed garden book that um, gives some really good basic understanding about saving seeds. Um, these are mostly vegetable seeds and I've, there's more and more books coming out all the time. So some of you also maybe in the chat, if there are a few other favorite seed saving books or other gardening books, soil books, compost books that you really love. I've just given you just a very brief handful tonight, but please share anything that's totally a favorite of yours. Um, I, I would love to see a medicine seed garden book come out at some point. And so hopefully somebody will write that book. Um, Strictly Medicinal is the seed company that I do purchase a few medicine seeds from. They do have some good actually information. Um, maybe they'll write the book, the medicine seed garden book. Um, but these are just a few pointers that I, I wanted to just include in to, to tonight's um, talk, just about some things to, to consider for those of you who might be starting some seeds indoors. And many of you may have a lot of experience with seeds, but I kind of just gave a few highlights here. Um, about whether you're, you know, if you're sowing seeds, whether they're light dependent. And when I say light dependent, very, very tiny seeds usually are light dependent, like chamomile. If you've ever seeded chamomile um, from seed, it, they're tiny little seeds. So you just kind of tamp them into the soil. You don't cover them. You just kind of really press them in. But your larger seeds, I say, you know, you kind of bury them twice a the depth of, like, you know, um, Zucchini seeds, those are big squat, you know, winter squash seeds, those are big seeds. So you kind of tuck them in into either it, in pots if you're starting them indoors or in the ground outside. Um, yeah, and so just uh, again, I have just a few more little um, guidance. Damping off can really be a, a challenge um, if you don't have enough good air circulation and if you've overcrowded your seedlings and the temperatures are low. It's a perfect storm for um, damping off, which is a soil fungus. Um, it's like too cold, too wet, too damp, not enough air circulation. Um, so you wanna be making sure that you don't overcrowd your seedlings and that there's even a little fan to give a little bit of circulation in the area where you might be starting your seedlings. And one of my favorite um, kind of the diluted kelp solution is may it's I get I get a kind from it's called Neptune's organic and they sell it I think by the by the pint the quart and the gallon and um, for us we buy a five gallon bucket of it from Fedco um, the organic grower supplies because I live near Fedco so I can go and pick it up but you could certainly for your home purposes consider a lot of um you can order it. A lot of nurseries and things do sell Neptune's organic. And that's just a really wonderful one to help ease transplant shock. Um, yeah, so there's a few pointers for you all. And then I just wanted to um, say something about container gardening. And this is a photograph outside our apothecary, which is a, it's just a window box. And as I said here, whenever I do any kind of containers, window boxes or, or big clay pots. I tend to use more glaze pots because they don't dry out. That glaze helps them not dry out quite as fast. So if you're in a, using just, just plain unglazed clay pots, just keep them in some kind of a shallow container so that they don't dry out too quickly. But I always use half of my own compost and half potting soil. 
in any kind of containers. So if, if you're if you're a purely container gardening person, you want to make sure that you've got access to really good compost um, because containers are not, you know, the, the plants are not connected to the soil. So there you want to really nourish those containers a little bit more. So this is these are um, nasturtiums that are in this window box. This is the Alaska nasturtium, the variegated nasturtium, which is my favorite one to grow. Um, and obviously I love nibbling in them, but I grow them for the for the ruby throated hummingbirds and I grow them for the bees. And this is a window right outside where where in the apothecary, somebody is inside, they might be filling bottles and they can see the hummingbirds coming to the window. And nasturtiums really like to have half, half a day of sun, half a day of shade. They don't like to have just sun all day long if you're growing them in a container. They love to have some shade. So um, beautiful to eat, beautiful for the pollinators. And we're gonna end with um, this beautiful quote in honor of this hummingbird. You can see their little tongue going for the, the nectar in that fuchsia. Hanging baskets of fuchsias also need to be in the shade, but they are such a gift to the hummingbirds. And Gertrude Simons Bonin, who is a Dakota Sioux woman who lived 1876 to 1938, she says to us, the voice of the great spirit is heard in the twittering of birds, the rippling of mighty waters, and the sweet breathing of flowers. So again, a great bow to um, so many around the world who are tending and caring for soil and seeds and pollinators and the human beings in their communities. Um, yeah, a lot of gratitude. So I'm gonna stop my share here. Yeah. Thank you, Deb. That was so beautiful. I love that hummingbird right at the last. Is that your image or is that an image from her book? It's an it's somebody else's image. It's so it's beautiful. beautiful image. Yeah. I grow those nasturtiums on, on our deck, you know, our porch, our covered porch, and the hummingbirds will come right up to the windows. It's so wonderful. So um, if you have any questions for Deb, she has offered to stick around and answer some questions about uh, the information that she presented this evening. I also want to invite you, if you're interested in learning, is uh, studying more in depth with Deb. Um, we're also going to stick around and we're going to talk about the whole garden. Uh, Ryan, I don't know if you wanted to start with that or we're going to go into questions. What do you think? And yes, this, this event was recorded. Abby will be sending you the link to the recording tomorrow. We also have a list of the books. We're very organized here at Botanic Wise. Well, at least Abby is. <laughs> Abby is so organized. Thanks, Abby. Um, yeah, well, I would well, love to know in the chat, you know, who's interested in hearing more about the program, because that's always really helpful for us. And we did put together a really cool guide. So if maybe, you were at the last webinar. Um, also let us know in the chat if you were at the last webinar. And it's always fun to see people who came back again to learn from Deb. And um, so what we did is we all um, took notes during the last webinar and, and got some more things from Deb and put it together into a guide, which I'll put in the chat right now. Um, ooh, Karis, it looks like I have your face on my on my Zoom profile. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you but, lucky? <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Abby made a, a PDF version. See, Abby's so organized. There you have it. Um, so yeah, so this is where the book list is. We're, we're gonna put the, um, the replay there as well um, when we're done putting it all together and we'll make sure to email it to you as well. So that'll be really fun to um, just get all those books and resources in there. Also, there's a really active conversation happening in the Botanical Quest community about seeds, seed companies. So um, who here is 
uh, one's a link to join the BotanaQuest community, that would be another thing we could share. Which is free, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a place to, to connect with each other and, and share stuff and um, be first to hear about events before they get announced to the email list. So Ryan, maybe you want to show a little bit about the program. I think we've got more interest in that again. Uh, fantastic. While you're pulling that up, Joanne has a question um, for Deb. I heard that putting seedlings in the dark first gets them to sprout faster. And as soon as you see the sprouts come up to put them in the sun, would you mind commenting on this? Yeah, it depends on what kind of um, plant you're planting because there are some seeds that need light. They're called light dependent seeds. Chamomile is one of them. That's why I don't, I don't cover, I don't cover it. So it's, it really depends on what the, which, which seeds you're planting, whether they're light dependent or not. Those who are not light dependent, it's fine for them to be in the dark, but when they do start to sprout, you need to bring them into the light, but you need to know strictly medicinals. He will tell you um, and he gives little descriptions after each of the medicine plants, and he'll tell you which ones are um, are light dependent. So, yeah, just have to know which ones are and which ones aren't. Uh, Patricia asks a great question. Are trees as influenced by the soils as plants? Is there a biodynamic food for our trees? Well, this is where that's a whole um, it's a really good question, Pat. Um, this is where the forest ecology needs to be intact. And which is why forests know how to, forests know how to take care of themselves with the dropping of the leaves and the incredible mycelium networks that, um, that forests make. And so you'll see that, you, Suzanne Samar describes that really well in her book, Finding the Mother Tree and Michael also. So basically, we want to we want our we want to support our trees. You know, if you're planting trees like I have here, like the hawthorn hedgerow, it's why I underplanted them with um, sweet Sicily as like a living mulch. I you know years and years and years the leaves drop, so they're mul continuously mulching themselves. <clears throat> I also mulch them with what we call um, more ramiel chips, or it's a they're they're wood chips. They're not what you buy in the nursery that are colored and dyed. These are brush. You know, this is like ideally you want to have chips that are not, you know, branches that are not wider than two and a half inches, which is not always possible to get. I can't always do that. My some of my I was out collecting some branches that have come down and that I will chip them all. So wood chips and leaf leaf litter wood chips are the best for enhancing the life of our trees and our forests. Mm. Just watch what they do. They are wise. <laughs> okay, Ryan, go ahead. Awesome, great. So what we have for all of you tonight for being here live is um, to introduce you to the program, but also to share a coupon that you can use for um, $100 off, $100 toward the program. So we just love doing this for webinars because um, yeah, you're the folks that are here with us, building the community together, participating. So we'll put the link in the chat as well so that you can check out the program. Um, the program is right on the BotanicWise website. So if you go to botanicwise.com, uh, you'll see it right there at the top of the page, whole garden. And um, so when you click on that link, you'll be able to read all about the curriculum and the program. And so I wanted to invite Deb to share a little bit about, um, you know, why you felt moved to create this program and also how it's different than, than the program that you did last year, mm -hmm. the healing garden. Cause I think that is really um, just important for us to, to hear the story about what motivates you to, to provide this transformation for us. Um. 
I was just looking at Gerard said, wood chips are wonderful, but sawdust creates a toxic substance while decomposing quicker than wood chips. So yes, wood chips are what you're going to want it to be um, mulching with. And just to say, that's why I really like Mycorrhizal Planet. Michael Phillips um, has done a nice job at really kind of helping us hmm. um, understand about mulching with wood chips, not sawdust. So thank you for that, Gerard. Um, I just was really inspired to help um, herbalists and gardeners and anybody interested in really in living plants to have a deeper dive into understanding soil and compost and how to build compost piles, both in your own backyard. And one of the guest teachers, Ceci, is gonna be giving us an incredible um, instruction into more more urban compost building. They worked in um, Brooklyn, New York with an incredible youth um, composting, community composting project. So I just have a very deep passion for, um, yeah, there's Ceci, for, I have such a deep passion for helping people understand like how to grow the best, the most vibrant, vital, spirit-filled, healing plants and food that we can. And so all of these guests that they're all, um, Ceci's gonna, is coming actually to be our, our intern at Avena this summer. Um, these are all dear friends of mine and who I have so much respect for. And, um, and Gabby, I have yet to meet, but Gabby comes so highly recommended to us from Megan. Megan and I have taught and worked together um, in a biodynamic program. So I just feel really passionate about helping to demystify and actually really re-inspire <laughs> um, all of us around soil. So both, you know, really getting practical with soil and Gabby's going to give us this incredible deep dive in to really meeting soil um, and understanding so much more about soils. And even if we're not a gardener, we all eat. And those of us who love medicine plants, you know, we call upon the medicine plants. So we all are humans living in this beautiful earth. Um, and the soil is so prominently important for us to understand who is soil and to really understand all the different ways that we can really nourish soil. We can build soil fertility, build topsoil. We all know that Tons and tons and tons of topsoil is lost every year because of really poor conventional farming practices. And that is a really serious loss to life. Um, and also not to say all the ways that conventional agriculture just destroys life in the soil. So this is really to just be such an inspiring class, um, both about soil and about compost and a little bit about the biodynamic preparations for people who may be curious. And also for me, I will be weaving in um, some of my favorite medicinal plants um, and a few medicinal trees that I think are really um, valuable plants for people to, and easy to grow plants for people to have in their gardens. Um, I'm like, I'm not gonna talk about holy basil like I did last year. Um, I'm gonna talk about mostly plants that I didn't talk about like I'm going to talk about dandelion. <laughs> dandelion is such an amazing, amazing so-called weed. It's like we got to get rid of, you know, get rid of this whole thing about spraying toxic chemicals on weeds and reclaim our weeds. So dandelion is going to be front and center to one of the conversations. So people who want to grow dandelion can grow it. Just understanding more about dandelion. <laughs> So, yeah. And then I also invited one of my oldest friends um, who I've worked with for over 30 years, Kwa. He's an incredible astrologer and such a therapist and a credible healer. Um, he's a brilliant astrologer. So he and I are actually going to do one class together, but he's also going to give us a class to really help people understand the biodynamic planting calendar the difference between Western astrology and the and the sidereal um, zodiacal system. So I'm pretty excited for people to to kind of dive into the calendar and understanding kind of Western astrology's gifts and then the gifts 
um, of the cosmos from a gardener's perspective. So yeah, I think it's going to be very inspiring. We're going to all be learning a lot. And then my friend Sonali and I are going to have a very, we're going to have a real live conversation about composting. And she's done so much work in the world. If you read her full um, bio, it's, she's, it's really impressive, um, the work that she's done in the world. Um, she comes, her father, um, I mean, her grandfather from Sri Lanka was a medical doctor and a, and a homeopath. And so she comes from that impulse and yet has been really working in, in organizations. So we're going to really have this conversation about bringing the human element into the conversation of gardening and composting. So it's going to be very lively and um, I think really inspiring this course. I feel very inspired by all of these wonderful guest teachers. Well, Deb, I have to say, I, uh, I just can't believe that this is actually happening. I've wanted this for so long, this specific class on growing with you, this inter, you know, the way you interweave not just practical, hey, this is how you uh, start seeds and, and transplant your plants, but the biodynamic principles, but also just the, the bringing it into our spirit, making it a spiritual practice, the art, the art of gardening, right? The Zen and art of gardening, um, making it a healing process to be in our gardens. I love that. That's what I want in my garden. <laughs> Something else uh, to point out about the way that we structure this is if you're new to Botanic Wise courses, um, we do everything in a community platform. So I mentioned the community earlier and the lively conversation that's happening about um, seeds right now, but we also have in the community um, is where you can access your programs that you're enrolled in. And then all of the events will be scheduled in, in an events calendar. So you'll get notifications and access to all of that. Um, and then also you can connect with other members, see who's online, uh, chat with people. You can post and share. So as you go through the growing season, you'll be able to try things out and get input. And I think that that's, you know, for us, I, one of the things that's been most rewarding over the last couple of years, like our team like putting together these programs with amazing instructors and then seeing how a community forms around it. So this isn't just a, you know, online course where you're watching some videos and, um, you know, and then never coming back to it again. This is a, this is a whole process of applying what we're learning. And I know that part of the, the reason that we get so excited about it is seeing the, the results that people are having. And then also the, how great it is for, the instructors to be able to do an online program in such a vibrant community too. So um, this is what it looks like when you log in and then all of the materials are produced by Abby, expertly produced and put together um, so that you always have access to it in a table of contents where you can track your progress and again, interact with comments and questions and things like that. So um, yeah, Karis, like how has the community been for you uh, since we started shifting in this direction? Well, for me, in, since we started the community on this particular platform, I feel like there's a lot more support um, between participants and it gives a chance for participants to share their knowledge. Like if you go to that seed, um, that seed catalog resource, a lot of comments have been coming in all week, people adding to, so it's not just Deb. And we're, Deb's getting a lot of support from people who have experience within the community, but also it just feels wonderful. It's, it's so much fresher than the Facebook world where we couldn't do a private group in Facebook and still be distracted by the rest of Facebook. This is really dedicated just to this program. And it's really easy to find new friends and connect and feel like there's just a little more support. Like, like the class is a real class, you know, like it's, it's happening in real time. And that is something to mention if you haven't taken a Botanic Wise program before. We do, the, we do host the classes live. Deb teaches the core classes every Tuesday. 
And then we have guest speakers on Thursdays. And then we end up on Thursday with a final sort of round, round it all up Q&A. And we usually do a community giveaway, which is really fun. Everybody contributes or anybody who wants to contributes seeds or gardening tools or gardening related items. And we uh, essentially raffle them off just for fun for, any, for anybody who's a student of the program. I don't know. I, I don't know what else I'm forgetting if anybody else has questions. I love the community. It's just my place. It's just my place to be through this whole lockdown period that we just went through. Oh, hopefully we're coming out the other end of it. I it say really it's really is like unique to be able to create a profile that is just for the like plant side of, of me, you know, it's, it's fun. It's not the same profile that I share with, with, you know, every other aspect of my life. So I can really like connect with people around, around this. So. So I think we might be done with questions. If anybody has a final question that I missed, please put it again in the chat. I don't want to miss your question before we send Deb home. Heather is looking forward to participating in the class. Thank you, Deb, for your great work. Stacy's oh. asking if the coupon applies to international students. Yes. Oh, we did forget to mention that we have a scholarship program. Yeah. So one thing that Botanic Wise is also really dedicated to is our scholarship program. And we raise funds to help um, anyone who feels that they can't uh, make ends meet to participate in the program. We don't, we wanna remove any barriers to participating in the program. Um, so please reach out to us if you would like the scholarship application. Um, we'd love to assist you. We still have funds remaining that are available. Um, um, Ariel, yeah, do you see Ariel? Is that what you're gonna say? Great question, yeah. I'm interested in the class, but only have a very small urban garden and declining physical capacity, but this still be useful. Uh, Deb, do you wanna take that one? Yes, Ariel, because it doesn't really matter about how much or how little we can do. It's really about the relationship that we're continuing to build with soil and whether even if it's just in container gardens that somebody might be having or you're a very small urban gardener. Um, I'd like to think that you will be inspired and the plants will inspire. There'll be a lot of information each for four different classes. I'm going to be giving detailed information about Yes, about growing, but also about how do we gather and prepare and how do we call upon a range of different medicine plants for, for their healing gifts. So whether somebody can actually garden or not, I like to think that this course will inspire people to be just much better educated and informed about soil and seeds and about working with healing plants. Yeah, you know, I've struggled myself with having um, trouble getting in my garden for as many hours as I want to be in there because of some physical challenges. And I just have a mindset this summer to just do what I can do to get out there every day if I can, even if it's only for 5, 10, 15 minutes, just to get my hands a little bit dirty, to be outside, to be to listen to the hummingbirds around me. And if I have a lot of weeds, I have a lot of weeds this year. That's just going to be the way it is. Hopefully they're dandelions. <laughs> Beverly says she loves the Botanic Wise platform. Thank you, Beverly. Thanks to all of you who have worked so hard on its evolution the past couple of years. Yeah, it seems like it's always been a thing, but it's really only been a couple of years. It's a true living community where authentic connection is possible at all times. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. 
Um, Ariel says, I'm very comfortable with using healing plants. I've been using herbs since the 70s. It's more the soil and growing that interests me. And that's what this program is about. Really focusing on that more than what to do with the plants. Although you'll talk a little bit about that too, right, Deb? Yeah, I am because it's all part of the picture from soil to, you know, seed soil to planting to harvesting and then just to be inspired by the plants. So it'll be, it'll all be included. Yeah. So I think the time has come to let Deb find her way home. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for your extended time this evening. I know, I know it's a lot after a long day um, and we're so grateful to you. Just so easy to listen to you for hours, your gentle voice and your wise words inspiring us ever, ever onward. I'm really grateful, Deb. Well, thank you, Karis and Abby and Ryan and Emma. And i um, really grateful to have this evening with each of you. So wherever we all are in this stirring of springtime, really wishing you each well and great joy and blessings. I think the, the seeding, the sowing of seeds right now with our prayers for peace, is um, something that we each can do. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Yeah. So good night, everyone. Okay.